tonight about the slate query business. But before we start, let me talk about Jack Conklin. Uh, I uh, was brought up on a family farm, uh, seven generations, going back to 1750-something. The original farm was on the very far east of the town of Hyde Park. The boundary was the town of Poughkeepsie on one side, the town of Pleasant Valley on the other. Mailing address was RD1 Poughkeepsie. We voted in Hyde Park. We went to school in Pleasant Valley. <laughs> went to Arlington High School. I got a uh, athletic scholarship to a prep school. From a prep school, I got a competitive exam to West Point. Four years with a engineering curriculum. Five years in the Army, 101st Airborne Division, pilot, paratrooper. My last assignment was on the staff of General Westmoreland, who was the two-star general commanding then. Left to go into civilian business. I went with Procter & Gamble as a project engineer. I built the first Downey pilot plant, you know that softener. <laughs> I installed the first Pampers line 50 some years ago. Wow. Left Procter Gamble, came back uh, to De Laval, worked my way up to president, then uh, bought into Standard Gauge, president and a part owner, then retired and moved to Rhinecliffe. So, 80 seconds, 80 years. <laughs> What we're going to, uh, I wrote an article uh, a year and a half ago, notice the headline, oh, Rhinebeck and the Slate Quarries. I got a phone call from the historian of town of Clinton. I liked your article, but those Slate Quarries are in Clinton, etc. Why don't you come and talk to us about it? So, they invited me to give a presentation. And I learned more about the slate query business from that talk. These people really knew what was going on. I have found some queries, uh, but not the main ones. So they told me where the location of the largest queries were. It happened to be their town dump. No wonder you couldn't find it. They told me about Silver Lake and the buildings around there that were once uh, uh, quarters for the workmen that uh, uh, worked in the quarries. Uh, I, you'll, you'll see a slide later on. I said, why did they fail? And after the lecture, a man came up to me and said, I work on Wall Street. I studied finances. He said, look into the recessions. I think there's a correlation. And he's right. I did, and there is. Well, that solved one of those mysteries. There was a post office over there called Slate Quarry, run by a Schultz, I don't know, John Schultz, a Schultz. So that, that, that was all new to me, totally new, didn't know anything about that. So I have incorporated some of their stuff into this lecture. We're going to talk about the slate queries here. 1790 is a category. It's not a specific date. Somewhere in the 1790s this started. And you're going to see it's hard to pin that down. I've got a couple of dates. And somewhere in the 1820s it closed and failed. Then I'm going to move to Slate Valley. 120 miles north of here. Very active slate activity today. And then we're going to come back to Rhinebeck because they started up the quarries again sometime around 1865 and closed down again somewhere in 1870. These are kind of foggy dates. Uh, the reason I got into this slate business is I was doing some other research and came across the Gazetteer of the State of New York in 1824. And it said, in the northeast part are some slate stone ridges in which slate of superior quality abounds. The quarries employ 300 
hands when fully operated. The population of Rhinebeck was 2,700, 300 people. An amazing economic activity. Then I came across an article uh, on New York in 1761. The colonial legislature met, passed a law that all buildings to be erected after 1766 in New York, south of Duane Street, should be of stone or brick, covered with slates and tiles. This is the market I'm setting up. Now, that got extended to 1768 and then again to 1774, and by that time the British were here, it was a Revolutionary War, so nothing happened until 1783 when the war was over. There isn't a lot of research material available on this slate business, but here in the uh, Historical Society I found one document. No name on who wrote it and no date on it, but in the last sentence, even prohibition in dry days that have fallen upon the whole country seem to have no effect in reducing the birth rate among the crawling reptiles of the slate quarry. <laughs> Not very academic, but flowery. So, prohibition, 1920 to 1933, I'm sticking a 1930 article. Give it plus or minus something. But, here's some interesting stuff. She talks, uh, whoever, I'm assuming it's a woman, I don't know, just by the flowery stuff. Um, she talks about the uh, Welsh families uh, who uh, do most of the work in the uh, slate mines who come to Rhinebeck regularly to buy groceries and other supplies. And this is kind of important because I could not verify this. The only remainders of the fervishly active past of the place are the huge cyclopean piles of slate which rise terrace upon terrace above the deep ravines from which it would seem a giant hand scooped them out a thousand years ago. We're talking about scrap, waste slate. I couldn't find it. Interesting. And then good old uh, Morris, historic Rhinebeck. Um, he's the one that provided a lot of the Welsh names. He also talked about the new business in 1970, or 1870, starting up. Um, so he, he was a pretty good source. And then just recently, uh, the town of Clinton has some good information. Um, there is a history of the town by William P. McDermott, 1987. Fairly current, and McDermott is a good researcher. I like uh, the way he pins down some of his facts. So, I'm going to use a lot of his stuff to talk about this. The first recorded statement about the slate query that I could find in 1798, slate was queried here for roofing on the home of Mrs. Richard Montgomery Rhinebeck. And you know that, Janet Livingston Montgomery. So, uh, but then uh, McDermott starts to research the organizations, the commercial organizations. <clears throat> 1802, New York State Slate Company um, acquired 14 acres in 1802 from Dr. Hans Kierstead. Kierstead right across the road over here. That was his uh, homestead. Wells, right? Now, then. Then in uh, 1810, uh, that went eight years. In 1810, they expanded. They bought 36 uh, acres and, and then 20 more acres in uh, May 18th of 1811. And here's something. On April 11th, the Dutchess County Slate Company at the same time purchased and installed slate dock facilities in Rhinecliff. Interesting. Because there's this debate on whether Slate Road is S-L-E-I-G-H-T or Slate. 
And I think that this kind of leans toward it being slave. 1820 started to decline, and then depending on who, whether it's McDermott or whether it's Old Morse, they closed 1823 or 1829. I think 1829. So that's when I said we'll use the whole decade. Somewhere in the 1820s it closed. Somewhere in the 1700s it started. Now let's talk about any quarry business. I don't care whether it's bluestone, whether it's cement, whether it's aggregate. Uh, these elements are important. You've got to have a market, you've got to have a source, you've got to get it to market. And then it involves the extraction, getting it out of the ground, and sizing it. And you're going to see that that makes a thing for this whole presentation. Slate is a fine grain, homogeneous, sedimentary rock which has two layers of breakability, cleavage and grain, making it possible to split into thin pieces. Schultz Mountain uh, is one of the highest points in northern Dutchess County, 780, 785, depending on who. It is today basically uninhabited. There are houses up there, but very few. And most of it is either owned by or leased to or hosted by the uh, Casper Kill Gun Club. Now, it took me an awful long time to find these queries. I mean, almost a year. I started down on Schultz Hill, Schultz Mountain, Schultz Hill Road. Uh, that goes over to Fiddler's Bridge, Mountain, whatever. Couldn't find any of it. I got uh, aerial maps out from Google, still couldn't find any evidence of the quarries. But a friend of mine, Jim Roselle, said, oh, I know where they are. I hunted there. I found them. I will tell you. And he did. So because the people in Clinton weren't quite as familiar with this Rhinebeck side, I decided to take them on a walk through. I said, we're going to start up at the four corners where 9G and 9 come together. We're going to go south on 9G till we see the sign for Slate Quarry Road. And we're going to turn left on that. And we're going to head. Now I'm going to go to the new information. We're going to head till we find the dump gate. Where is the dump gate? There it is. Now, if they didn't tell me it was a landfill, under there, you, you would go right by it. You'd never find it. And in fact, if you go too far down the hill, you come to these transmissions line. You went by it. It's 100 yards back. It's just a little, uh, you've got to really look to, uh, for that sign. The quarries parallel about 100 yards back these transmission lines. And there's evidence that there were buildings there. This is an old foundation. It was probably some part of part of the clerk's operation, or I don't know. But this is what they look like. It's been all filled in. That's why you couldn't find it on the map. There any holes in the ground. Um, but you can see the slate formations sticking out. And that's what it looks like. But it's long. It's a couple of hundred yards long. So that was a big, major quarry. And I never found it until I talked to the Clinton. So now I'll come back and tell you how to get to the one that I found originally. Slate so Quarry Road, you'll come across the sign that says Mountain View to the right. It isn't a very big road. You go up about a half a mile and you'll see the sign to Stone House. And Stone House is literally a little dirt one lane road. And what you're looking for is a little pull off that looks like this. It's one car. Um, a path, uh, a trail that heads back into the woods. And if you go too far, you come to the stone house. That's got some history to it, so I don't talk about that. So you got to go back, and we'll start again on this thing. And if you walk in far enough, you're going to share it with the Land Skill Trail Association. Rondo, that plant right through there. So they. 
use this. And you go a little further, half mile in, you start to find the old quarries. Filled up with water. Um, now, these go back, if we're into the 1790s, 215 years, something like this. So you can see the, the trees have started to uh, grow out of it. I don't know how deep the water is, uh, but there's a whole string of these. All connected. Now, this is the only residue, the only waste I could find. Nothing, just a little scrap pile. Where did all the mountains of scrap go? And when I went up to Slate Valley, there's literally mountains of this stuff. Um, maybe they found a use for it, maybe they used it for fill, I have no idea. But I cannot find any reference to the piles of scrap that was referred to in the 1930 article. Don't know. A key to this whole operation is getting the stuff to the river. According to uh, Morris, ox cars, horse and wagon, um, and the uh, docket, uh, uh, Bateman's Mills. Now this is, uh, Nancy and I have discussed this. This is, this is a little tricky, but this is from Morris. When the Slate Quarry was opened about 1795, there comes another flexible date. Shipping point, um, the, the cove was a shipping point for the slate. The Beekman dock on the cove was a very busy place. From the south end of town, it controlled the trade. And Nancy told me that a man by the name of uh, Quinn or Quill was the early uh, operator of that, and Schultz may or may not be involved. But it, it, Schultz's, Schultz's uh, dock up by 199 was not involved in this. This was, this was down in the Rhinecliff uh, area, whoever owned it. And then you've got Sleep Dock Road. Again, we talked about this. Is it S L E I G H T, which people have corrected me, you know, you should really look at that. Uh, but I think now that I found that in 1811, the Dutchess County Slate Company invested <coughs> it, that it probably correctly named. This is what it looks like today. Not much out there. Pile of rocks. I want to talk about this is from Morris, the Welsh. Why Welsh? Why uh, are the Welsh so associated with the slate business? This is an article of uh, archaeology this uh, March. 2016, current, quote, a team of archaeologists and geologists excavating in ancient quarries in the Priscilla Hills of West Wales has confirmed that these sites are the sources of the 43 blue stones erected at Stonehenge, weighing on average uh, with one to two tons of volcanic rocks were transported to Stonehenge sometime around 3000 BC. <laughs> These Welsh guys have been doing this for ever. It's in their blood. I call your attention to Jones. My mother's grandmother, my great grandmother, uh, was a Jones and told me that uh, uh, her ancestors were in the stone business. They lived in uh, Stamfordville on a farm. Uh, her father was a Civil War uh, veteran, so I need a lot more research to pin that down, but I think there's a connection <coughs> between that Jones family and our friends down here. Okay, we're going to leave Rhinebeck and we're going to move 120 some miles north to Slate Valley. Granville, New York has a Slate Quarry Museum. There's a 24 mile stretch, 6 miles wide, all slate deposit. Most of it in Vermont. Pulteney, uh, the Lake Romacene, West, what, well, Charlton, can't read it from here. Only a few in New York State. Uh, but the, the, the dotted line is the boundary. Most of it is in Vermont. They have a beautiful building that houses uh, a museum. Fairly new. 
it's an old post and beam barn that they've moved uh, down there. And um, uh, uh, people were most accommodating. I sent them an email said I'd like to come and talk about this, that I had to do a lecture. They were amazed that there was a slate business down here. They didn't know that. So I, I exchanged some information. And they in turn gave me a run of the place. Um, provided a lot of data. Um, one thing that I did learn, that the first slate query up there was 1839. Now I say that because Hasbrook in his history of Dutch's County said the Rhinebeck uh, slate query shut down because Vermont offered a superior uh, quality slate. Can't be. They shut down in the 1820s and they didn't open the first month 1839. So you see how the research, you have problems with research and dates, and it's hard to pin some of this stuff down. Okay, inside that museum is a big mural. Does that look familiar? Does it look like the Rhinebeck Post Office? Because it should. It's part of the 1933 New Deal the Federal Buildings Public Works of Art Project, um, our own Rhinebeck Olin Dows was uh, responsible for selecting um, the artists. There were 850 art, uh, artists involved, 137 murals, uh, all in federal uh, buildings someplace. This, I was told by the uh, uh, executive director up there, started in the post office when I had a new post office. They moved it to the high school where it was in the cafeteria, she said, when I went to school. And then when they built the museum, they moved it there. This depicts extraction. You're hauling the rock out of the pits, and you've got to take it someplace so it can be sized. And this mural is the sizing. And those are the two elements of any type of business. Now, now we come to the tricky part. This is why the Welchmen were so important to this trade, because they, uh, they had the tools, they had the experience, uh, they had all the gadgets to make this work. Um, what, I, what I'm trying to explain is the process of uh, taking the object straight up vertically, transferring it to a cable, uh, half inch thick, and then moving it some distance to where it's finished. Now let me come back to my experience on the dairy farm. When you had a load of hay before there were bales and they were all loose, you drove your horses into the center of the barn and you had a contraption, a, a fork it was called, uh, connected with pulleys and all the rest to the barn. The fork was U-shaped, had a little handle on the top. When you pressed the handle, two six-inch layers levers came out to hold the hay. So you shoved the thing down as far as you could, pull the lever. On it was a, 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 a rope that the man in the mouth could release. You unhooked the horses, put them onto the uh, uh, ropes, and you pulled the hay straight up till it hit what we call the frog, and it slid along a track until the man in the barn released it, and it dropped. I bet that somebody took that technology from the Welch. The only difference is there was more complicated because you were latching on to a half-inch cable instead of this mounted rail. And this is an actual <laughs> copy of this device. I don't know how it works. Extremely complicated, but you're going to pull it up with a bunch of uh, uh, through uh, pulleys until you can transfer it overhead to that half inch uh, cable, and then you're going to pull it up to the work site. And you need either horses or steam or some means of making it move. Okay, let's talk about size. Basically, hand tools, split it just like you would a piece of wood. 
And in the, the shop are some, I'm sure, Welch-inspired devices. This is a brake. This uh, cuts her off in the right size. And this is a punch. And those are my <laughs> experimentation with this device. It's got a wheel on it. It comes up and it comes up. Boom. Big sign on it. Do not touch whatever. And she's there showing me how to work it. <laughs> they, were, they were wonderful. Okay, we're going to talk about some products. Um, the big 90% of the business is roofing. And you notice the holes. Slate is not nailed to the roof, it's hung on the roof. The holes are pre-made and you put the nail and there's a slight movement. It's not a tight fit. It's enough to let it expand and contract and so on. Uh, a properly installed roof will last 100 years. It's, it's an amazing roofing material. This is Rhinecliffe. This is the Methodist Church, um, built in 1855. The uh, land and the uh, funds to build it was donated by Mary Gerritsen, the only uh, offspring of Reverend Freeborn Gerritsen and his Livingston wife, Catherine Livingston. They lived in Wildercliff on the uh, river, um, right up from you. Um, sold a early part, it was a sale to the Sukleys, and then the second generation built the whole, bought the whole thing. Now, the reason I'm showing you is a privately owned residence now. And about four years ago, they hired a team to come in and steam clean the uh, uh, slate and repair some of it. And out came the colors and some of the decoration. And I talked to the crew that was there, and they uh, were out of Long Island, they covered all over New England, and that's all they did is slate roof repairs and installation. They knew where to go in Slate Valley to get the bright colors. Wow. Each little quarry up there has its own little color coded uh, uh, products. Now, this is an aside, but Mary Gerritsen owned lot number one, the first burial plot in the Rhinebeck Cemetery. And if you say who was buried in her thing, and you said Gerritsen, you're wrong. And Maria James was buried there. And I just found out this out a couple of, uh, uh, couple of actually a couple of days ago, um, right here, um, when uh, I learned that Maria James uh, published a book of poetry, uh, and she was uh, communicating. Uh, with Beverly Kane. Beverly said, I've been in contact with a researcher in Cambridge who, wants, who has told me about the history of Maria James and its connection to the slate query. Um, and it's here. Maria James was seven years old when her family immigrated to Clinton with other Welsh families. Maria was 10 when she became a servant in the freeborn Gerritsen household, Wildercliff Rhinebeck. She spent all of her life there. They educated her, whatever. She died in 1868 and is buried in their plot. And she has published a book, Welsh, Wales, and Other Poems in 1838. And that's what this uh, researcher from Harvard was investigating. Now. Freeborn Garrison started a revival among the Quarry Welch. And Mary, uh, Mary James' father became a religious man, a lay preacher, etc. Her mother ran a boarding house out there. Her father became a revivalist preacher. Interesting piece of trivia. That's all it is.
All right, back to Slate Valley. Look at the colors that are available to the market. But there are other products. This is some kind of cocoa loafing or a stove of some kind. I don't know. This is a, uh, a mantle inset. All carved out of slate now. And here comes the reference to scrap. 90% is scrap. And there you can see the great scrap piles. I'm still perplexed at what happened to it here. Welch, from the 1850s on through. Oh, here. Come back and back up a bit. The first uh, quarry up there, 1839, Scotts Hill, something like that. The first Welchman came in 1852, and then a whole slew of them came. The reason they started is the railroad was there. Remember, to, we got to get it to the market. The railroad came in in about 1845 in that era. And the mines started in full about 1850. Um, 1855, there were 20-some, 25-some uh, mines. Uh, by the turn of the century, there were 100-some quarries. It really, uh, really took off. Uh, and it's still active today, so it's, it, it's, it's a viable business. Then came the Polish and Italians, and it, it, it was the immigration wave that... Uh, now look at this motley crew. Oh my gosh. Boy, Vermont men. Yeah. Now, um, we talked about active queries. There's a whole slew of them. But I point out the Rupee Slate Company. I'm going to come back to that. They offer, this is the museum, offers a, uh, a guided uh, tour, a driving tour. Uh, they give you a pamphlet and some stuff, and, they, and, and you can follow the numbers, two, three, four, all the way around the thing. Um, worth it. I'm going to come back to Rhinebeck now. This is the second restoration of the slate business. Hudson River Slate Company, uh, according um, to Morris, a Williams Woodworth started it. Uh, he's probably right. Um, in the uh, history of the fold-up of the old slate company, um, let me see if I can find this. I'm going back now to when the 1829 company failed. Um, the property in 1831 was sold, they, were, they weren't bankrupt, it was gone. Um, it, it went to a, on the market to a widow by the name of Hannah Gale in New York City. Then a John Gild, Gillender in New York City bought it. Then he sold it back to the local, Benjamin Schultz, Schultz Mountain, Schultz, 1833. In 1836 he sold it to a Henry Eckert. And Eckert kept it all the way up until 1865 when a John Stoutenberg in New York City bought it and, and used the purchase of those 230 some acres as his share of the Hudson River Slate Company. Big mistake because they went bankrupt in 1869 so he lost uh, that investment. Sold at public auction. So we're back to uh, Mr. Smith from Vermont, according to McDermott, uh, was in charge. I assume they brought this guy down who knew how to run a, uh, a quarry. They uh, invested in new buildings and machinery in Rhinecliffe, but again, I can't find where or when. Their products were a higher scale. They weren't into the roofing. They were into something that would command perhaps a higher price. Billiard tables, mantles, tiles, covers, etc. And this, why did it fail? I facetiously said they didn't have enough Welshmen. Uh, and a man called me and said <laughs> from your article, thank you for saying kind things about the Welsh. <laughs> It's, it's amazing. 
But at the uh, lecture over in Clinton, the man explained his theory, and I think he's right. Because, um, let's see if I can find that reference. Yes, okay. These recessions coincide with both closures. The early uh, 1820 closure, the panic of 1819 was the first major financial crisis in the new United States. General collapse of the American economy persisting to 1821. Ties right in. Then, the uh, second longest depression before the 1929 was 1873, 1879. 18,000 businesses went bankrupt. 89 railroads went bankrupt. 10 states went bankrupt. Hundreds of banks. So this happened right when this guy was trying to launch a new business. I'm, I'm completely convinced the recession was the perpetrator. So if you're interested in further information on this, look into this Sleep Valley driving tour. It looks like that. There's the numbers. You get a brochure that describes each one of those places. And here is the executive director. Look at the name, Krista Rupi. She told me that her grandfather worked in the Slate Quarries and that they're still involved in the business. And sure enough, Rupi Slate Company. She was a very knowledgeable uh, person, uh, very personable. Uh, uh, if you're interested, I advise you to go up, introduce yourself to Christy, and tell her that Jack Coughlin sent you up. Thank you. <laughs>